All right, well, welcome to the uh, first technical session of the 34th Annual Small Set Conference on Space Mission Architectures. Uh, I'm uh, looking at numbers cranking in right now. I uh, welcome everyone, hopefully coming over from the uh, great conversation to start the keynote with uh, Dr. Scalise. I'm Aaron Rogers, I'm the technical chair of the conference. And uh, as we embrace this all virtual format uh, this year, it's so great to see everyone sort of back convening together with us online. Uh, a reminder that like every year, uh, all of our papers and posters are freely available uh, online right now. Uh, in addition, uh, as I hope many of you have explored, uh, the recordings of all 162 talks, Swifties, and NASA briefings are also posted for your viewing as well. So I'm, I'm hoping you, everyone's had a chance to dig into those since the weekend. Uh, I certainly hope you've had a chance to watch the, uh, the sessions for uh, the, the talks for the session we're about to endeavor into now. Uh, in this uh, one hour webinar, uh, moderated kind of Q&A exchange, uh, we're going to have our moderator, I'll introduce momentarily, um, each, uh, introduce each of our uh, uh, six presenters and then uh, go through some questions with them, have a chance for them to provide some background uh, and summary of their talking points and their presentations and then go into some Q&A. And then after that, we'll have the opportunity for the field uh, to bring questions in uh, uh, from everyone in the audience. And I'll be helping to uh, work with a moderator to curate those. So please, as a reminder, there's a Q&A tab at the bottom of your um, Zoom session. Please submit your questions there. Uh, as uh, for those who were participating in the last session, we were, I was pulling those in and bringing those to Pat. So that's what we'll be using again to get questions into our, our, our presenters. A uh, reminder, of course, um, to uh, you know, please keep their questions positive and clean. Um, and again, we'll try to get through as many of those as possible uh, in, uh, as time permits. Uh, so without further delay, it's my pleasure to introduce the session chair, uh, Mr. Steve Nixon uh, of the Small Set Alliance. Uh, Steve is the president of Small Set Alliance. Uh, he's a CEO of a startup security company and a strategic consultant. Uh, he's the former director of science and technology of the U.S. intelligence community and founder and first acting director of IARPA, as well as a former professional staff member of the House Appropriations Committee. Steve, over to you. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, really appreciate uh, that intro and being here and kicking off the uh, first technical talk uh, for the conference. It's uh, a great honor uh, and to follow uh, Chris Scalise, who uh, gave a, a wonderful uh, keynote and then um, if anyone who hasn't seen his uh, intro video that was posted over the weekend, I definitely commend uh, that to everyone. Um, he talks quite a bit about uh, the NRO adopting the hybrid space architecture, which is something that's uh, very near and dear uh, to my heart. Uh, I, I represent the Small Satellite Alliance. We're about 50 members strong. And uh, the hybrid space architecture is, is a, a very important uh, and key way that uh, small satellites can be introduced into uh, government architectures. And so it's very important for the future. Uh, if you haven't seen uh, Chris's uh, intro video, uh, definitely go check that out. Uh, I'm, uh, I've been telling some of the other folks uh, online here as we're uh, setting up that uh, there's a line of storms coming from the tropical storm, but they're uh, due to hit me uh, right around 4.30. So we'll see how resilient uh, our local systems in the DC area are to that. I think uh, Aaron is also uh, in the area. So uh, we'll, it's a little bit of a competition to see who survives uh, uh, the big storm coming up. But hopefully there won't be any glitches. It'll be just fine. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, we have a number of uh, planned speakers that, that are not with us at the moment. Uh, since we are the first uh, technical uh, panel, I mean, there's a good chance that folks are just, you know, still trying to figure out um, the technology uh, and, and how to sign in. So uh, if uh, our, our representatives from NOAA and the Army are, are out there in the audience uh, uh, panicking and trying to figure out how to uh, break onto the panel from the audience, I think the uh, best way maybe is to reach out to Michelle and, and let her know uh, uh, that uh, you're out there. And I think she might be able to promote you to the, the panel. We'd, we'd love to have you on here. Um, we also are looking for uh, one other panelist, um, uh, Luis uh, Pinion uh, as well. So if you're out there in the audience and you're like, how do, how do I get in? Uh, just uh, send a private message to Michelle and hopefully she can work that out. So the way uh, we'll, we'll proceed is, um, I was hoping to get uh, talk to the Army and NOAA first. I'd love to hear from, from you know, uh, customers uh, and then and then segue into um, uh, folks that are, are, are dealing with the, the larger aspects of, of architectures. Um, but uh, since uh, we're still working on, on getting uh, uh, 
uh, the Army of NOAA on board, um, we'll, we'll just uh, proceed. And so uh, the, the first is uh, Martin uh, Fugman, who is uh, coming to us from uh, Germany. And uh, Martin, if you uh, are able to uh, get your video and audio going, I'll uh, introduce the paper uh, that uh, uh, he submitted is an automated constellation design and mission analysis tool for finding the cheapest mission architecture. So a really good uh, start to uh, an architecture panel. Welcome, Martin. And uh, why don't you take a, a few minutes, you know, just like two or three minutes to describe your paper. And then I have a few questions for you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Steve, for the introduction. And uh, hello, everybody from Germany. Um, so as Steve mentioned, the title of my paper was uh, an automated uh, constellation design and mission analysis tool for finding the cheapest mission architecture. And um, what it's basically is about is that it's a, a combination of several tools that myself and also colleagues uh, from Stuttgart are working on. And the goal is to have a tool that identifies basically a lot of different constellation um, configurations, so orbit, constel orbit configurations, um, in order to fulfill uh, the task on hand, and then use an automated mission analysis tool chain um, to provide input for further satellite design tools, um, which will then provide a satellite design, or more, more specifically, a preliminary satellite design for each of the constellations that was identified to fulfill the mission. And with these satellite designs, then a launch can be selected and in the future also a cost estimation software can be applied. So um, the overall goal is to um, identify the cheapest mission architecture. So to um, identify the cheapest combination of mission elements like the orbit, the space segment, uh, ground segment, and also launch vehicle and not just, just not looking at like the orbit first and then looking at the satellite second and at the launcher third, but to look at all these elements together and identify the solution that is the cheapest one overall. Um, yeah, I think that's, uh, I hope that's enough of an introduction. I'm not sure how uh, yeah. I wasn't present in the, in the uh, talks this morning, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. That's great. I, I think we're inventing this, Martin, as we go. We're, we're the first <laughs> for, this, for this style of panel. So maybe the first in, in all of small sat history right here. Um, so everyone's looking at us to figure out uh, you know, how these all will proceed. So I have a few questions for you, uh, if you wouldn't mind, um, about your tool. Uh, and you know, the, the first that comes to mind is you know, does it uh, accommodate both uh, large and small satellites? Um, and, uh, and what space mission types are supported? And, you know, I'm thinking like, is it Earth observation? Is it communications? Is it uh, precision navigation and timing? So just kind of wondering what, what, how, you know, what all the things that, that you can do at this point. Um, for, for the satellite size, in, in principle, um, we don't really care about the satellite size. So it can also be larger satellites. It uses more like a, a scaling based on the, the payload that's provided. Um, but in theory, most constellations will in the future go for smaller satellites, probably. So it's more, it's more relevant for small satellite constellations than for uh, formations of few large satellites, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, for the type of missions, um, right now is a lot focused on communications payloads um, because we have, we're uh, trying to get a first um, application with an industry partner, which is a communications payload. Um, but in theory, um, we also can use the tool for optical or like Earth observation payloads in the future. Um, they will definitely be supported. Um, for the uh, navigation, etc., I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's uh, more like a maybe, maybe not, I think. So what, what have you found so far as being the most computationally complex uh, element 
of, of trying to determine the constellation automatically. Well, the, um, the identifying the constellation itself isn't really demanding at the moment because it uses a lot of, of analytical methods. Um, it, there are some simulations implemented for that task, but they are rather short. Um, I use some commercial simulation software, namely Astos, but also um, parts of the ESA drama toolkit. And uh, these calculations for the mission analysis, they do take some time. If, um, have you found any, like anything that's really surprised you? Uh, any kind of, have you run any uh, automated constellations and, and come up with something that, that no one's really implemented before or that, that you didn't know was a thing? I, I don't remember anything uh, special in particular for now, no. And then there's a, another question from um, the audience uh, that was pre-submitted. Uh, I think they're very interested in, in what you're doing and they're just wondering, uh, is your tool gonna be made available for others to use and, and, and in what way? <laughs> um, that's a yeah that's a good question of which i am not entirely sure right now i mean um first of all it's part of a larger research project funded by the federal state of baden-württemberg so um it will be made available but first of all for our industry partners and after that it uh, will of course be um may it be made available by our um, project lead which is the german aerospace center dlr so um, we, are, we haven't decided on the, the way it will be made available for now. And it's unfortunately also not entirely up to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Well, before I, I uh, move on to our next speaker, is there anything, uh, any point that you'd like to make sure gets out there or that, uh, that we haven't really covered that you'd, you'd be interested to make sure everyone knows? Uh, there was one question in chat I'm just seeing right now um, from Ravi Deepak who asked if uh, one of the um, mission elements um, for the constellation is for the collision avoidance and uh, I can say yes I use a, a sub tool of the ESA drama tool set um, to determine the uh, fuel amount that is will be required for collision avoidance in the orbit that is being um, analyzed. So we definitely have collision avoidance and sustainability in space in mind there. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Martin. Um, let's move on to uh, Stan Kennedy. And Stan's paper is enabling hybrid architectures and mesh technology topologies to support the global multi-domain community. Welcome, Stan. Uh, thank you, Steve. You're coming to us from Colorado? Uh, yep. Uh, I see the just, flag back there. You bet. Got uh, Colorado well represented, I think, today. Yeah, that's awesome. Appreciate your time. Yeah, and I think hopefully uh, everybody can hear me. Um, yeah, I, uh, a little bit of background on the hybrid architectures and the mesh networks plays very nicely into Dr. Scalise's presentation a little bit earlier. Um, here at Oakman Aerospace, we've been working on hybrid architectures for the last six years. And what we're focused on is the enablers, so communication enablers and network enablers that tie these systems together. And what we do is we utilize bridges and transport layers to tie those disparate systems together. Uh, we were selected uh, uh, last year, middle of last year for an AFWorks challenge for the multi-domain operations. And what we did was we brought our ACORN system, which is a long uh, name, but Advanced Configurable Open Research Network, Open System Research Network. And what it allows you to do is compose systems of systems very rapidly. And what we're finding is those bridge systems and the protocols that tie those systems together are allowing all of these disparate systems to be able to tie together through electronic data sheets and machine to machine data sharing. So our ACORN product actually ties into the NASA Spoon database, which is the space parks on orbit now, and also the European 
search database and it can ingest all of those electronic data sheets and very rapidly configure your system assistant. Excellent. Great. Um, so when you when I think of the hybrid space architecture where you're uh, you know the vision of bringing both commercial and government satellites big and small together uh, in a seamless way for the future um, you know, we're going to need some, you know, we're going to need this network that you're describing uh, in space. And I, I almost think of it as like, you know, the internet, but this is an opportunity to, to um, correct some of, the, some of the problems with the internet, which uh, probably the biggest one is the security uh, aspects of it. Um, is there, have you um, given much thought to, to that and, and how we can both create a network that we can use for the hybrid architecture and do it in a way that that is a more safe than, you know, than, than the networks that uh, we were developed in the 60s and 70s? <laughs> yep, most definitely. Um, and, and I think it breaks down into there's, there's communication enablers. And in the old, you know, sort of the, the past many, many years, it was point to point. So you had a ground system that was tied to a spacecraft and it was very, very stovepipe. And what we're trying to do now is go from communication point to point to networks where you're either doing multi-path and networks. And I think some of the things that are enabling that are, as we start to move into 5G and, and the ability to do slicing of those channels out to multiple vehicles or to be able to do hub subsurfaces for those applications, that's what's really enabling this next step in capability to be able to bring parts and pieces into or out of the system very rapidly. Excellent. Um, what, what do you think we're going to need to get broad adoption of uh, a hybrid space architecture mesh network? Um, so I, I, we're I gluing together of, everyone, right? You know, yeah. they, they be, and so do they all have to agree? Is there a way to seed, you know, plant a seed that grows that everyone can come tend and, and uh, how 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 can we how can we get from idea to to reality? Yeah, I think again, I think that the enablers are standards. So there's a lot of work going on with CCSDS or uh, uh, electronic data sheets. There's a lot of work going on in terms of open system interoperability, where you define an electronic ICD between the two disparate systems. And again, our Acorn product does a lot of that bridging work and transport work through agnostic messaging systems. And, and again, I think the interesting part is, and, and it's really exciting time to be in small satellites, but into the next, how do you tie disparate systems together, government to commercial or coalition to commercial systems, and how do you bring them in or out of those systems rapidly? So again, I think that uh, electronic data formats, you know, the CCSDS Red Book is a, is a good start. Um, I think a lot of the work that's being done in terms of the um, uh, messaging uh, systems. So Air Force Research Lab and uh, Space Dynamics Lab had the SPA Services Manager. There's a number of other things, ROS and Active MQ, uh, MQTT, those types of down and dirty physical and protocol interfaces are allowing those systems to be able to be composed very rapidly. And there are active working groups right now working on this, cross government, cross companies? Yeah, and, and also internationally. Um, you know, I spend a lot of time on uh, the uh, work group two interfaces integration and test of ISO for the space systems uh, work. And, and that's really being adopted worldwide as the de facto standards. Great, awesome. All right, well, uh, let's move on to uh, our next speaker, uh, Walter Scott from Maxar, and uh, we'll let him turn on his video and audio, but uh, his paper was Design Drivers for a Viable Commercial Remote Sensing Space Architecture. And uh, I will say it was uh, an outstanding video. Uh, I, I really appreciated learning more about uh, some of the considerations that went into to Legion. So uh, if anyone has a chance to check that out, I would definitely recommend that. But uh, Walter, welcome. And uh, tell us, uh, summarize uh, in a few minutes what, what we saw in that, that great video. 
Well, thanks, Stephen. Because I'm a talking head here, I won't be able to do justice to the graphics and the paper. So um, I encourage people to take a look at it. You know, we often say that space is hard, uh, but making money in space, particularly in a remote sensing business, is actually a heck of a lot harder. And so in my talk, I shared the insights that we've used to drive the architecture for our next generation satellite constellation, which we call Worldview Legion, to make sure that space-based remote sensing is a business and not a hobby. And the key design drivers boil down to supporting the use cases of paying customers, like those of the US government, which you heard from Dr. Scalise, uh, allied governments, uh, major technology firms, and those drive parameters like satellite resolution, which is driven by physics. And it turns out to be very important for applications that use artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, driving requirements for accuracy, positional accuracy, uh, for area coverage, for synopticity, for the orbit choices, ground systems, and sensor design. Uh, and of course, doing this in a way that's disruptively affordable, which continues our two, two decade long trend of challenging ourselves to disrupt ourselves. And so the Legion Constellation is on track to begin launching next year. And we're already starting work on what goes into our next generation of Legions. And we're very open to ideas from the community for what technologies and capabilities we might incorporate to make it further useful to our paying customers. And so I'm very much looking forward to the questions. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, well, you've been at this for quite a while, and but you, uh, in the, when you were in the midst of doing the design trades for Legion, did you, were there any big surprises uh, that you weren't really expecting as you were looking at the different trades and, and options? Yeah, well, one of the surprises turned out to be uh, something I did talk about briefly in the talk, which is we were initially thinking of a um, uh, continuing with a few large spacecraft and then adding a number of much smaller, smaller aperture, lower resolution systems for revisit. And what we found as we started to look at the, uh, the economics that it actually drove us to a very different, very different point. It drove us to legions, which are apertures are a little bit less than a meter across. You can actually see a legion um, telescope in the background uh, behind me. It's, it's on its side, obviously. It, the photo has been rotated. Um, I think some of the other things that were a surprise were that by dropping our technological sea anchor in 2017, as opposed to when we had done our prior generation, which was Worldview 4 in uh, 2009, we were able to do for $600 million, six satellites, what had previously cost us $850 million for one satellite. And we were able to get three times as much capacity. And of that capacity, it was triple the capacity in the highest demand areas, which were people pay money. So it was it was somewhat a positive surprise to see that we had um, a uh, that big a, a, a sort of disruptive jump in uh, capital efficiency. And in, in terms of implementing the that design, were there any breakthroughs that allowed you to do with the smaller aperture what you couldn't do before the the, the technology of twenty seventeen. <laughs> What uh, that anchor that dropped then? What was there breakthroughs that allowed you to do something? Uh, well, some of that, yeah, yeah. some of that is it's an architecture trade. So um, you could fly a bigger aperture at a higher altitude, a slightly smaller aperture at a lower altitude, and so you need to look at where's the the optimum in that system cost relative to capability curve, and so there were some things that happened uh, between. 09 and 17 in making optics in this class affordable, uh, giving a slightly better performance, uh, not violating the laws of physics. So, you know, no smoke and mirrors here. Um, and then on the, the electronic side, uh, electronics miniaturization helped us uh, tremendously in terms of size, weight, and power. So we were able to cram uh, substantially more functionality in a smaller number of boxes, uh, which simplified the, the interconnect, the assembly integration and test. Um, so those paid dividends. But at the end of the day, you know, if you're doing Earth observation, you, you're sort of limited. You fly low enough, you burn up. So you can't get that close to the ground. 
And that drives you to sort of minimum size aperture if you want to get decent resolution. All right, awesome. Well, I think that is uh, our first uh, path passed uh, through our initial speakers. Um, we were uh, expecting, uh, like I said, uh, I think three others. So this is a great opportunity for, for us to uh, dive deep with these speakers that we have. And so um, let's go out and see if there's some questions out there and from the audience. We have, uh, by my count, uh, almost 400 participants uh, tuning in, which is, I think, uh, the largest Zoom call I've, I've uh, had the privilege of being on. So um, what, what questions do folks have out there? And let's see, I think I have uh, the first one uh, for uh, Walter. Um, let's see, so instead of a high-low architecture, you found that a purely high architecture was most favorable. Well, it depends on what you mean by high-low. So um, if high is referring to aperture size, what we found was kind of a Goldilocks that there was a just right answer. Um, you couldn't actually meet the customer use cases if you offered resolution below a certain threshold. And if you wanted to go to bigger apertures flying higher, that drove the cost um, in a nonlinear fashion so that it wasn't particularly attractive it, it, you know, because at the end of the day, we have to make more money than we spend. And so we ended up with uh, Legion. Now there's some other benefits that you get by, by settling on a single thing. One of which is that you can do a block by, you can amortize your non-recurring engineering across multiple units uh, as opposed to having two different designs. So that also played into the affordability. Excellent. Uh, we have another question for Stan uh, on our panel. Uh, the question is uh, in reference to the hybrid space architecture. Uh, let me see. Uh, what do you project the time of delivery would be for a hybrid capability from concept to the edge or end user? Uh, and uh, it says with rapid on demand tasking and data dissemination. Uh, so there's there's many many uh, S and T uh, studies and science and technology studies that are going on right now. Um, best guess from a research and development perspective, uh, prototypes probably in the next three to five years, and operational systems quickly after. Um, you know I, the interesting part is, and again I think a lot of what's happening, especially with the. Um, uh, travel restrictions and everything else, one of the nice things about the messaging systems that are being worked on is you can tie together geographically dispersed or distributed systems. And I think tomorrow uh, in the morning, there's a, a demonstration of this where we're gonna tie our facility here in Denver with new space systems componentry in South Africa and mission operations controls out at KISP from the United Kingdom. And all of that's being enabled by these messaging systems that are what are the foundation for the hybrid architectures and uh, the mesh network communication. And so a lot of the early work's being done now, but like I said, uh, I, I'd say in the next three, three, three to five years, demo missions very quickly followed by operational systems. Excellent. Uh, next question is for Martin. Martin, uh, how can various scoring rubrics be applied to each factor and can the factors be weighted in the determination of the optimal solution? And can it be easily extended to include ad hoc or other factors? Um, so um, as, uh, as I said, the, the main uh, goal is to use a cost estimation software to identify the cheapest solution. So the overall cost is, um, the main metrics that we want to use. Um, and this will be implemented so that um, the, the cost estimation software will run as part of the entire tool chain on a server, but the, the user will have options to set this cost estimation function up in the way he wants it. So he can adapt how individual factors are taken into consideration there. Um, but that's not more like related to the entire tool chain. I'm not just entirely on my tool. Okay. 
this is a question. Uh, next question from the audience is for Walter. Uh, how does flying lower affect your resolution as a function of off nadir angle? And then there's a f another question. What governments, international organizations, and NGOs are best using commercial imagery for environmental and humanitarian applications? Okay, so with regard to the first one, uh, again, sort of basic geometry. And I see that, is that, was that for Marty Fega? Um, <laughs> uh, hey, Marty. Was it? I Looks like it was. Um, so, so Marty, of course, knows the answer. Welcome, to Marty. Yes, uh, yes, he's setting you up. He's a straight man for you. Yeah, so, so you fly lower and, um, of course, the good news is that you're closer to the ground, so you get you know, better resolution at Nader. But as you start looking further off to the side, your distance increases. So it's just a geometric factor. One of the things that we found, though, was that the um, ability to pick an optimum between the sort of collects that we were doing for mapping purposes, which generally required a, a narrower range of off Nader, and those that we use for monitoring type applications, which could accommodate a higher off nadir angle um, and gives you the benefit often of being able to see things from a perspective that wouldn't let you recognize what you're looking at straight down. Um, that let us do an optimization. Uh, relative to the second question, um, if you go to the Maxor website, uh, we publish something on an annual basis called an impact report. And that actually talks uh, in great detail about the, uh, the organizations that we work with for uh, environmental and humanitarian purposes. And uh, it's got some great examples in there. Um, and uh, I, I encourage you to check it out. It's, it's available on the Maxar website. Excellent, great. Uh, this question is for Stan. Um, how does your ACORN tool uh, leverage public, open source, and government databases and other content? Is your solution all proprietary? Uh, no. In fact, uh, what we do is we have obviously our bridges and how we tie those together is uh, proprietary, but we have open uh, API developer guides. Um, we have uh, message uh, XML generators that can allow people to build their own scripts. Um, Acorn is a framework, and the, the really cool part is, is we, we seed it with dynamic and vehicle components and uh, flight software, ground software, but if you want to unplug any one of those and plug your own system in, it's very, very easy to do because of the pub sub services and the messaging system. Um, as I mentioned in the, in the opening, we tie into the Spoon database, which is the NASA Space Parts on Orbit Now database, and we also tie in with the European Space Agency SAT. But what we're doing is we're actually trying to harmonize those two data through electronic data sheets. And I think those are some of those enablers for the, in, in the future that are going to truly allow people to drag and drop parts and pieces into and out of the system. Okay. Um, and just as, uh, so this is a great news for Noah. I'm, I'm a, it's a shame that uh, our Noah speaker isn't here, but right on time, the, uh, the storm has hit me <laughs> right at 4.30. So hopefully it'll, it'll all be okay. Um, from a, a glitchy zoomy standpoint. But uh, this is a question for our entire panel. What is the optimum mix of government and commercial funding to support a mission architecture? I guess uh, I'll, I'll jump in first. This is Stan. Um, you know, it, from an optimal mix, I, I think the government does things really, really well that don't have necessarily early commercial application. Um, so they do the hard stuff that doesn't pay back very quickly. I think the commercial side of the business does a lot of the stuff that, you know, like Walter has a business payback uh, system. And, and I think the yin yang between those continues as you do tech development of new ways of doing business coupled with the uh, obviously, we're all commercial, or at least I'm a commercial guy, Walter's a commercial guy, you got to stay in business and make money. And so the early design and development, the technology enables the CIBR or the, what are, you know, what used to be called 616, $63 dollars. That I think is, is what seeds it. And then how do you transition that into commercialization rights and data rights to keep the commercial businesses going? 
I think the U.S. does that very, very well. We spend a lot of time uh, as Oakman Aerospace in the European and the African markets, and, and I think they're emerging and they're actually starting to learn from the, the uh, early stuff that we did back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s that now they're seeding their commercial opportunities. And you'll see that in the new space systems top 1000 list. Um, the US it used to hold about a 60%, 70% market there and the new space uh, rest of world was much, much less. That's actually now switched where the US is just under 50% and rest of the world is now above 50% in those new space markets. And so we spend a lot of time working with those up and coming um, uh, space markets. Walter, do you, um, do you have thoughts about the optimum mix between commercial and government? Stan did a great job of-, of uh, He did, didn't he? Uh, that was a great yeah, answer. I, <laughs> that was I, a great I answer. I could really add much. Uh, <laughs> and it basically boils down to um, uh, two things. One of them is governments are good, as Dr. Scalise mentioned, at driving uh, the development of new technology, qualifying new technology, uh, so that it becomes available for more general use by industry. And uh, you know, we're, we're, we're very fond of saying that if uh, somebody else has already developed it, um, there's no reason for us to have to do it. In fact, uh, uh, there's a, a story about software developers that there's a difference between a good software developer and a great software developer good software developer is uh, industrious and intelligent. A great software developer is lazy and intelligent because if they can find something that's already been done and they don't have to do it themselves, that's fabulous. So, you know, we aspire to be great. Um, the optimum mix, that's sort of a, almost a backward question. The, the real question is which customers can we serve cost effectively where we can make money and we can deliver value to them. And that's what determines the optimum mix. Martin, do you have any thoughts on this question? Um, I'm afraid that I can't really add a lot to that since I have just an academic background. So I think um, the colleagues did a great job answering that. And I'd, I'd rather, uh, <laughs> I don't think I can say anything good on that. Sorry. All right, no worries, no worries at all. Uh, let's see, a question for Walter. Um, can you provide an update on the status of assembly, integration, and testing of the Legion satellites? And have there been any, any, any impacts on the schedule from COVID-19? Sure. So, uh, I mean, you can see the photo in the background, which is, um, was done some number of weeks ago. It's uh, uh, part of the testing that we do for the, the optical system. Uh, and you saw copies of uh, or photos that were in both the paper and the talk that gave you kind of an early um things that a mother would only love the 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 construction of the spacecraft but uh we've got six legion spacecraft moving through the factory um and um they are uh, in the relatively late stages of both instrument and spacecraft integration the instruments start getting integrated with the spacecraft a little bit later this year um the second part of the question was covid or something else uh, impacts from COVID, yes. Yeah, relatively minor. I mean, there there have there have been uh, a few cases where we've had a supplier who had to uh, shut down for a short period of time while they figured out what was going on. Uh, there have been relatively minor uh, hiccups in things like uh, the the delivery uh, infrastructure for getting uh, getting parts around. <laughs> And it mostly was in the early days as people were figuring out like what did what did uh, what did COVID mean, um, but it hasn't had a, a material effect uh, you know, of any real significance on the on the schedule. Thankfully, if you saw me startled, there was a lightning strike like right outside my uh, window here. Yeah, I heard that. And your, it didn't affect your power or your video or anything. No, it just affected me. I was like, Holy yeah. whoa. What was that? That was pretty. Whoops, we just lost Steve. Aaron? All right, let me jump in here. Since we have some uh, downtime, it looks like. I'll wait for Steve to come up on freeze frame. Uh, I'm just looking at some questions that have also coming in. Um, great uh, uh, circle around and see what I had just posted up here. Um, hey, uh, so Stan, you mentioned a demo uh, for your. Um, Coming up, is it tomorrow? I understand. 
Oh, yeah, we have a, a live webinar at uh, 9 o'clock uh, Mountain Time, uh, local to Logan, and I think that works out to 3 p.m. UTC, but there is in the... You're on mute, Stan. How about now? Good. Hey, sorry about that. So, yeah, the, we're actually doing a live o'clock tomorrow, Mountain Time, which I believe is 3 p.m. Universal. Uh, uh, there's a link in the chat, uh, and what we're going to demonstrate um, how we gather ACORN mission operations from KISP and hardware in the loop testing down in South Africa with new space systems. And, and it's all done geographically dispersed with dispersed organizations. And, and I was mentioning before, and piggybacking a little bit on what Walter said, when COVID hit, we actually didn't miss a beat um, besides building acorns. We had the ability to virtualize all of the machines and be able to push those updates around the world. And so we've been doing that over the last uh, three, four months during the COVID crisis. <laughs> So again, another testament to the uh, network operations of hybrid architecture. Yeah, you've had those, those virtual demos uh, sort of annually, haven't you, with great success? Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, we've expanded out now to where, again, KISP is doing all the mission operations at their facility, all the hardware's running down at uh, uh, Cape Town or uh, Somerset West in uh, South Africa, and then we're virtualizing our command and control interface uh, here in, in Littleton, Colorado. So. It, the neat thing about it is, is that allows you to expand out and our on-prem and off-prem allow you to basically containerize each of those uh, uh, systems and you can actually then spawn those out to customers. So there's, there's just some really cool stuff going on in how to do these messaging systems and, and, and mixed uh, message hybrid architectures that uh, hmm. we spend a lot of time in. Let me tee up, welcome back, Steve. Uh, let me tee up one more question, I'll hand it back to you. A, a question for everyone, uh, and then we'll start, maybe start with Martin, since uh, he may have something to say here. A question coming from about from Justin regarding, uh, curious if there are any types of industry information that you didn't have, but if you did, would have better informed your decision-making process for supplier relationships, or some of the biggest supplier-related challenges you encountered? Martin, anything, well, maybe partnerships or relationships you've got through other academy networks or, or developer teams that you've worked with, you would have hoped, wish you'd had uh, looking backwards? Um, I basically came to the project when it was uh, readily established, so there were no decisions on my on my end to make. <laughs> so, unfortunately, no. Okay. Uh, maybe Walter, do you want to take the, take the next? Uh, would you restate the, que the question, please, or reframe it? Aaron, you're on mute. Sorry. Ah, now I'm doing it myself. Uh, so the question has to do with perspective. I got actually yeah. a couple perspective questions. But this first one is, has to do with uh, looking back in time with hindsight, uh, how might you have done things differently if you had been better informed about supplier relationships or offerings of the community that you maybe weren't waiting of at the time decisions were made? Um, that's, that's somewhat of a tough one to answer because we actually do quite a bit of outreach to understand what's in the supplier base. Um, that's, that's a core part of the DNA. And that's one of the reasons why uh, we don't start like trying to do a top down design and say, well, you know, can you build this? It's often done the other way around, which is understanding what the capabilities are in the industry and merging that with what we see as the, the market needs. Um, and there, there actually is, quite a bit of good information out there, both in terms of uh, the supply base. Uh, conferences are wonderful. They're a wonderful opportunity. Uh, the the SmallSat conference, for example, it's just fabulous as a way of, uh, uh, I don't know about this virtual format, but uh, but physically we've had people coming to the SmallSat conference for a number of years. Uh, and then some of the other major conferences in the industry, uh, the Satellite Conference, uh, Space Symposium and others. So, so I am back. Um, hopefully, uh, <laughs> uh, as uh, as feared, um, the storm uh, did did have an impact, and and my power went off, and and Wi-Fi had to reboot. So, Aaron, thank you for uh, covering, and uh, uh, that I'm glad we had that chat beforehand that that could be a possibility. 
Uh, let's see, uh, we have a question uh, for everyone from uh, uh, Justin uh, from Global Space Exchange. Uh, he's here, uh, curious if there are any uh, types of industry. We're going through that question already, so it stands to answer now this, uh, of, the, of that same question. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, well, I was away. Okay. Uh, how about the question? Uh, I have a question here for Walter. Was that available? No, no, no sorry. Stan, Stan hadn't had a chance to weigh in on the on the question yet. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, okay. So still kind of catching up. Sorry, guys. Yeah, no, no worries. Um, but uh, you know, to piggyback a little bit on what Walter said, you know, we spend a lot of time uh, looking at uh, at conferences. Um, obviously, we've been a part of Small Sat Conference for many, many years. Uh, we also participate in the 4S, which is the Small Satellite Systems and Services Conference, which is in, in Europe on the even years, except for this year because of the pandemic. And then the uh, IAA Berlin Conference, the Small Satellites for Earth Observation. And, and again, those are three of the big small sat conferences that are all collectively aligned that provide not only the technology, but the basic enablers, some of the new capabilities that are coming online from a components perspective, but also from, from the software. And, and really, you know, I'm a hardware guy. Um, so, you know, I've built hardware and flown a lot of hardware and the, the new stitching of everything in our Acorn product is heavily software based. And I think you're gonna see more and more of that as these hybrid architectures come together and how we tie those parts and pieces together. It really becomes, uh, you know, the machine, data sharing and electronic data sheets. And I know I keep harping on those, but those enablers are what we're seeing start to manifest themselves more so in a lot of the small satellite conferences. The, the componentry and the technology is fantastic, but getting the bits out and turning it information is again, where the money maker's at. And I think Walter's made that abundantly clear. All right, uh, the next question is for Walter. Um, you started a space company in 1995 um, before new space was was a was a, a thing uh, <laughs> and um, do you sometimes wish that you were uh, born maybe 30 years later uh, to start your career in the current environment well I sometimes wish I was 30 years younger yeah uh, not necessarily the same thing um, I actually started the company back in 1992 and I remember when I was going out to raise um, funding for the company, uh, there were two objections that got raised. Uh, one of them was uh, the space thing. Um, you know, you push the button and the satellites either go up or they blow up. That's a hard risk for people to get their heads around. And the other was uh, a lot of people thought the internet was going to be a fad. Uh, so in some respects, starting a uh, business that relies heavily on the internet for all aspects of the business um, it was it was a bit before its time. If I had the opportunity to go back and do things differently, I probably would have started a software company or an internet company and used the funds from that to fund the remote sensing business, kind of like what Elon did in the launch business. Call it Facebook or Google or something, and <laughs> yeah, something like that. Um, so uh, this is a question um, for for everyone. Um, you know, a lot of the talks that uh, everyone posted were kind of snapshots of a point in time today. And if you were to look ahead, um, you know, what, what do you see things, how do you see things uh, being different uh, in the coming years? And let's start, uh, let's start with uh, Stan for this. Sure. Um, yeah, you, you, where I see things going, uh, if anybody hasn't heard of space dial tone, um, you know, nowadays everybody has their, their phone strapped to them. They don't wait for a pass. They don't wait for somebody to line up or drive by the right cell tower. Um, you just, your satellites are going to be able to pick up, make a connection and download data. And whether that's a cross link, a direct downlink through commercial or other services, double bounce, whatever you want to call it. So I think Space dial tone is going to be a thing. Much more commercial services. Uh, there's many, many ground service providers that are going commercial. You can AWS or Atlas or a bunch of others. Uh, RBC. Um, I, I, I think that 
people are going to be very, very specialized in, in where they play in those markets, but they're going to all interoperate and talk together. And, and, and they're taking lessons from the Googles and the Facebooks and, and Alphabet and everybody else in terms of how do you move very, very quickly. And I think the faster you can turn on that technology, the more relevant you're going to be. And the, the turn cycles are going from multiple years to single digit years to now, you know, turn within a, a, a yearly POM cycle or a, a yearly FIDEP cycle and, and stay, stay relevant. All right. Uh, Martin, do you, um, what do you see for the future? Uh, yeah, I, I expect a lot of, um, yeah, what, like, let's say satellite as a service or, um, a lot of, a lot of services focused on, um, specific elements or like, so there are a lot of service providers that, uh, aim to bring together like marketplaces to, to bring together um, satellite customers, um, satellite uh, builders, uh, mission um, mission related service companies, and I think this will be uh, um, in the next years. A lot of things will be about um, not being the customer and paying one company to do everything, but um, being a customer and uh, yeah, just just getting getting the individual services you need from from like uh, satellite ebay as i like to call it awesome walter three trends um much higher degree of interoperability um building a lot of what stan was talking about uh the second one is as more and more services become available particularly in the sensing realm and uh, whether it's diverse phenomenologies uh or other um, other approaches to uh, sensing, you're going to see more data available, and that's driving already uh, the development of AI ML techniques for being able to exploit the data deluge. You're going to see much more data that is looked at by machines than is looked at by humans. And the third is um, referring back to Dr. Scalise's talk that there will be a need for a more uh, disciplined approach to space traffic management as more and more assets are placed into space because we all want to be able to continue to use it. Um, it's an incredibly valuable resource and we want to make sure that it remains that way for future generations. So those are my three big trends. Excellent. Thank you. All right. One last question. Um, and this is, uh, this is in the category of a uh, final fun uh, for each of you. Would you favor your ideal mission architecture to be in the DC or Marvel universe? And you got 30 seconds. We'll start with Stan. Stan, DC or Marvel? Uh, man, you put me on the spot. Uh, I got I to gotta go Marvel. OK. Why? Uh, and uh, the quick reason? Uh, just the, not, not quite as dark. Yeah. Okay. Walter. Shoot. I was going to put my justice league satellite up in the background. I'm actually a big fan of the Marvel comic universe, but I think DC has done more in the, in the satellite world than, uh, than Marvel has. Oh, interesting. Okay. Martin. I'll go with DC. DC. And why, what is just your for, thought there? Just for, just for Batman. No, you like Batman. <laughs> I'll, go with, I'll go with Marvel myself. Uh, just seems to be more, uh, I don't know, more modern techie uh, to me. Uh, so anyway, let's see. Any parting thoughts? I think we have uh, just a couple of moments left. Aaron, is that true? Or do you need to uh, do a, a segue here to the next panel? Uh, no, I'll let you have parting, parting thoughts. We want to just make sure we stay on time. Go ahead. Okay, um, maybe just a lightning round. We'll go around the corner, is around the, the whole panel here. Uh, we'll start with, uh, let's say Martin on this one. Any parting thoughts for the group? Uh, well, I guess I'd, I'd just like to say uh, thank you for the over 400 people who came here today. Thank you at the, the SmallSat conference, SmallSat Alliance for making this 
conference happen in this uh, interesting times to say so. And um, I'll hope that we can maybe meet again in person next year. Great. Sam? Uh, you bet. Uh, besides uh, running a business, I'm also the Frank J. Red Student Competition Technical Chair. And we spend a lot of time with the students and pass it on to the next generation. So if you've got some time on Wednesday morning, we're doing the live award ceremony for the six finalist teams. Uh, and we even have one from Germany uh, all over the world. But really, if anybody has as much gray hair as I do, forward to the next generation because uh, that really is our future. Great. Thanks Walter? for everybody putting this together. Thanks. Walter? Keep innovating. And uh, for those of you who are early in your careers, uh, possibly even uh, college students, uh, we've been continuing an internship program. Uh, we think it's fabulous. We've got well over 100 interns uh, participating virtually this year. And uh, we are always looking forward to seeing more talent get into a space business, uh, which, you know, it's a business, but we also love it. And, and for uh, everyone else, uh, thank you all for participating. Uh, that was a fantastic panel. And uh, uh, we all coped with the weather. So Aaron, thank you for standing in uh, for me when I lost power and disappeared for a while. And, and thank you for all your support uh, behind the scenes as well, Aaron. And um, just uh, it was a, a great panel and a great way to kick off the, the week. Yes, uh, my thanks to the panelists. Thanks to you, Steve, for a great moderating job and helping keeping this moving, and uh, Michelle facilitating, and encourage everyone else attendees to keep uh, enjoying the rest of the week of these uh, webinars. Uh, thanks for participating, and uh, hope to see you on uh, a session session this week. Thanks. Great. Thanks, everybody.